Suppose that you need to flip a coin 10 times and record the number of heads you obtain. What kind of result are you expecting to see? Would you expect that outcomes will go back and forth between heads and tails? Well, probably not. We will get something like this. So in this example, we have three heads and seven tails, right? Now, altogether, what we just looked at is called probability experiment. A probability experiment is a repeated process with uncertain results. So we repeatedly flip a coin, however, we're not sure what's the result or the outcome um, every time it's going to be. Now, in this little example, we can see that there are 7 out of 10 heads. But what if we flip the coin a large number of times? How often would we expect to get heads in that case? Well, how about infinite number of times? Of course, we can't really do that by hand, but if we just imagine flipping coin an infinite number of times. Well, because there are only two possible outcomes, heads or tails, for each toss, um, and those outcomes are equally likely, right? So it's not like, it's more likely to get heads than tails. They are equally likely to occur. We would expect to get heads about half of the time. But notice that here, half is, is written as a fraction, one half, right? Well, we actually can say that probability of getting heads is one half, or 0.5. So what is the probability? The probability of an event is the proportion of time the event occurs in the long run, as the probability experiment is repeated over and over again. And this is called the law of large numbers. So it says that, once again, as the probability experiment is repeated again and again, the proportion of times that a given event occurs will approach its probability. So here is a chart showing uh, the number of tosses. Now along the horizontal line we have number of tosses and along the vertical line we have proportion of heads. So as we have a small number of tosses like 10, maybe 15, 20, 100, we can see that the proportion of heads varies, uh, varies larger in fact. So in some cases, proportion of heads can be like 0.25. Um, in some cases, it's close to 0.5 to half, but it's still, it's, it's varies, right? But we can see how as the number of tosses increases, the proportion of heads for those experiments, as we get bigger and longer experiments, the proportion of heads getting closer and closer to 0.5. Well, 0.5 is somewhere over here, right? So one half. So as the probability experiment is repeated again and again, and that's the number of tasks being increased, the proportion of times that a given event occurs will approach its probability. So with the example, when we toss a coin, it kind of makes sense that if we toss the coin a lot of times, then about half of the time we should get heads and half of the time we should get tails, even though they will not alternate, really. We have to count that at the end of the experiment. But can we calculate probability without repeating experiment 1,000 or 1 million times? Well, we can, and it's called a classical method of computing probabilities, and that method works for experiments when where outcomes are equally likely. So here is another example. An experiment consists of rolling a six-sided die once, and we need to find probability of rolling an odd, odd number. So first of all, again, I want to point out that when we roll a die, then all outcomes are equally likely. So what are the possible outcomes? So when you roll a six-sided die, what can you see when, when, you, when you roll? Well, you can see one, two, three, four, five, or six, and all those numbers are equally likely to appear, right? And um, those numbers are all possible outcomes in general. This is called the, sam the sample space. Now, we need to find probability of following an odd number. So, which outcomes are the odd numbers? Well, there are 1, 3, and 5. And again, um, as I already mentioned, these are equally likely outcomes. That's important. So, outcomes with odd numbers 1, 3, 5, they're just some outcomes from the sample space, and it's called an event. So, event can be some outcomes or 
all of the outcomes or none of them. So it's kind of like a sub subset or a subgroup of all possible outcomes. So how do we find the probability of rolling an odd number? Well, we're going to use formula, but first let's just look at the numbers um, for this specific example. So to find probability, this is what we're going to do. We're going to set up a fraction. Now in the denominator, in the denominator of this fraction, we're going to put the total number of all possible outcomes. Well, if these are all possible outcomes, then there are six of them, right? And then in the numerator of this fraction, we're going to put the number of odd numbers. So in other words, we're going to put the number of desired outcomes. Our desired outcomes, they're desired because we, uh, we're trying to find probability for those um, outcomes happening, right? Um, there are three of them, one, three, five. So that's the number of desired outcomes, and in this case, odd numbers. And once we set up that fraction, well, we're going to obtain probability. In this case, it can be simplified. And 3 over 6 simplifies to 1 over 2. So that's going to be the probability of that event. We can use special notation when we um, you know, work with probability or answer questions about probability. And these are a few... Um, few things you need to know about notation. Um, event, sometimes we denote by a letter. Well, here it's uh, E, but it can be any other letter. So in this case, E would stand for the odd number, uh, odd numbers on a die. And um, if E is defined that way, then P with E next to it inside the parentheses, P of E stands for the probability of the event E. So P stands for probability and E stands for event E. Um, it's also common to write this out using words or mathematical symbols. Um, we could say instead of E, we could just say odd numbers, for example. But P always stands for probability. So using that notation, putting all together, we can say that P of E is one half. And um, this is an alternative way of writing it. So we can say P or for probability of getting one or three or five is one half. So we'll we'll see more examples with this kind of notation. So we'll get used to it. And finally, here's the definition um, for the formula or for probability formula when we deal with equally likely outcomes. That's important. So basically, this formula says that if um, outcomes are equally likely, and we want to find pro to find probability of an event A, that's the name of that event, then we have to take the number of way, a number of ways that A can occur and divide that by the number of possible outcomes. So um, that's the formula. Um, however, not all outcomes are equally likely. Here's an example. All right, I should say, here's the question. Do people tend to associate names with faces? Here are the two pictures, and the question is, who is on the left, Bob or Tim? So what do you think? Who is that person, Bob or Tim? Now, when I do this example in class, it's kind of a little bit more fun to hear responses, so I want you to answer to yourself, what do you think? Is it Bob or Tim? So I'll give you like a second, and then let me tell you that I think you said Tim. And if you said that the person is team, then you answer the same way as majority of people answer that question. So apparently people tend to associate names with faces. And what's interesting behind you know, what the story behind this question is that actually those two are not even real people. So these pictures were created after different people were asked um, how they would describe Bob and that, how they would describe team and based on descriptions provided by different people, well, they put together um, those two pictures, generated those two pictures. But the point of this example is the following. So the chance for the first person um, to be called team is more likely than to be called Bob. So if we think about this in terms of probability experiment, then we can see that these outcomes are not equally likely. And then how do we calculate probabilities in this case? Well, in the case when outcomes are not equally likely, we have to use the empirical method. If you remember, when we use classical method, 
We don't really even have to conduct experiment. We can mathematically calculate probability. What, in the case of experiments where outcomes are not equally likely, we have to use empirical method, which consists of repeating an experiment a large number of times and using the proportion of times an outcome occurs to approximate the probability of the outcome. So what that means, it may sound a little bit too much right now, but if I go back to my previous example, what it means is, is that, so to find the chance that someone would come this person on the first picture team, first we have to question a lot of people and ask them, um, what do you think is the name of this person, Bob or Tim? Collect that information, record that information, calculate the proportion of people that named that person Tim, and then use that proportion as probability, and then interpret that probability as the chance that this person would be called Tim. So, uh, once again, the empirical method consists of repeating an experiment a large number of times, and then using the proportion of times certain outcome occurs to approximate the probability. And what is the proportion? Well, proportion is the same as the relative frequency of the outcomes, remember? So if we put this all together, then to find probability of the outcome when outcomes are not equally likely, we have to calculate the relative fre frequency, which is, which is going to be approximately the probability. And... Um, how do we find relative frequency? How do we calculate relative frequency? We have to take the number of times the outcomes the outcome is observed. So like the number of people that called that first picture team, divide by the number of repetitions of the experiment, divide by the total number of people that were asked that question. So that's the idea. Just same old way as we calculated relative frequency before. So here's another example for using the empirical approach to approximate probabilities. If we want to determine the probability that a smoker household in Boston will experience fire damage in the next year, what we need to do, we need to find the relative frequency, or proportion in other words, of smoker household in Boston that, that experienced fire damage last year. So we can estimate we can estimate it by computing the relative frequency of smoker households in Boston that caught fire last year. So we find proportion or relative frequency first, and then we use that relative frequency to approximate probability.